welcome you to the World Bank Special Session Information Limited. My name is Emilia Carranza. I am a senior economist at the World Bank Jobs Group. And today we will have like three presentations, uh, one on small firms, whether they are constrained, experimental evidence from Ghana. Uh, Jamie will be introducing uh, us to this research and then followed by Vittorio talking to us about and supply side policies to tackle youth unemployment. And finally, I will be presenting you some preliminary work uh, about information on the two sides of the labor market. So I would like to welcome Jamie and to invite to start the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for having me, and thank you to, to, to the organizers of the conference. Been really great so far. It's been such a good experience. So it's really great to hear about all these papers on jobs and development. Um, okay, so this is our small firms labor constrained. I'm guilty of using the title evidence from that we just learned about. Um, can you help me with this? Thank you. Um, okay, so the motivation, one motivation that we've been hearing about a lot um, at this conference, sorry, is this working? Hello? <laughs> is that better? Super loud? Okay. <laughs> uh, one motivation we've been hearing a lot at this conference is about youth unemployment uh, in developing countries. And what this paper is trying to do is kind of pair that with another kind of stylized fact that we always see about the private sector in low-income countries, and that's that the firm distribution is dominated by small firms, so it's extremely left skewed. Um, in Ghana, there's a, there's a national industrial census that attempts to capture formal firms, and even among formal firms, 94% of manufacturing firms are employing fewer than 20 workers. So what we're trying to think about here is the sort of labor demand side and link that to this literature on small firm growth. And this literature has mostly focused recently on uh, capital and found that, that there's a really high rate of return to capital in small businesses, but that these sort of capital drops are increasing profits, but they're not increasing employment. So is there a way that we can bring these things together and kind of increase employment in small firms, or are there some sort of labor constraints that, that small firms are facing? Um, so throughout, throughout the presentation, I'm going to show you some um, think qualitative work, although I'm not sure that real qualitative researchers would think of this as qualitative work. But one advantage of collecting your own data is, is that you have the opportunity to talk to the people whose behavior you're trying to study. And so we did uh, a lot of that with, with the firm owners in our sample. And one of the things we asked them is, what are the three biggest barriers to the growth and success business? This is a common question you're going to see these um, World Bank Enterprise Service, and in our particular context, that about half of firms are, ci are citing that they find it hard to find good workers. So that's sort of another way of thinking about, about being, uh, this study. Um, the context here is pretty important. We can argue that's potentially generalizable to other settings, but the context here sort of frames the way that we're thinking about, about, about the region. So apprenticeships in West Africa and in Ghana in particular are extremely widespread. So 25% of working age Ghanaians are either currently apprentices or have completed an apprenticeship. So this is, this is a normal institutions pervaded in West Africa. And I understand that it's sort of flowing elsewhere, but, but it is an important for training and employment institution in West Africa. Um, and the way that it typically works is that entry into an apprenticeship starts with a pain payment and the fee is somewhere around six months so the wages this is going to be paid throughout the the period of the apprenticeship and and, and kind of recall this class idea of like buying into a Sometimes you can start to finish earlier. 
Uh, here's the context. We're looking at the informal sector, so the production technology here is um, often pretty rudimentary. Uh, if you think about the firm, 66% of the sample are female. 34% uh, of the firms are registered in the district assembly. Um, I still think of those as informal firms, essentially. What that means is that someone from the district assembly came around and asked you for recruiting money. Um, only about 7% of the firms actually pay taxes. An important caveat to this is that there's sample selection of the firms into the sample. So the way that you enter the sample is that the local uh, trade associations, there's trade associations with all of these very um, skilled trades, or the local government that works with small businesses asked you if you wanted to apply to receive some additional apprentices. So we're looking at a sample of firms that wanted to hire more people. Um, if you think about their experience with apprenticeships, 95% of the firm owners in the sample have completed an apprenticeship. Um, and apprentices are the vast majority of the workers in these firms. So 80% of the workers across all the firms are apprentices. 89% of the sample had at least one apprentice working at baseline. 80% of the sample had trained at least one apprentice and had that person complete. Um, the average wages that these apprentices are getting at the baseline are about 10 to 12 dollars a month. So it's a relatively low paid job. Uh, if you think about the workers, they're also excluded female. This isn't intentional. This was just who got recruited into the program. Uh, the mean age is about 23. 30% of them had some prior experience with this apprenticeship, and most of them were inactive at the time that they applied to be part of this program. Um, one important thing is that we measure cognitive skill in the worker baseline, uh, using these four sort of classic measures of cognitive skill. Um, and the other thing is that there's also sample selection into the practice sample. So this worker study was embedded in a larger RCT that's about the returns to uh, apprenticeship training. And there was about 2,000 apprentices who made initial applications to become, to sort of be matched with a firm. Um, and also were in this sort of other RCT treatment group or a group that was handpicked by the government. So of those 2,000 people who were sort of invited to continue their application process and actually get placed with a firm, only about 1,200 of them actually completed all of those meetings. And that sample selection is going to be central to the way that we think about what's happening in this paper. Uh, so what do we do? It's a field experiment that randomly offered small firms the opportunity to hire unemployed young people as apprentices. Um, at the time, it was um, inspired by an ongoing study that was done by Tanel and St. Woodruff of Beach Studies in Sri Lanka. And they actually find relatively low take-up rates. Um, so our findings are, are sort of contextually different, but we're also going to come to different conclusions about labor constraints for firms. It's also related to some of the other papers that we're going to hear about today, um, two-sided labor market experience, experiments and experiments about other sort of labor market frictions in these kind of contexts. So the treatment here, just because it's not totally obvious, um, in this worker recruitment services, so essentially what the firm is getting is they're getting one of these kind of um, one of these workers who went through this application process uh, placed with their firm. And the treatment variable is a multi-value treatment variable, so it's the number of those workers that got assigned to your firm. So it's not that you can get zero or one, you can get some multiple, but most people get zero or one or two. Um, today I'm going to focus on short run effects, so we're looking at surveys that are about three or six months after a consensus placement. I'm also going to show you just in the raw data that, that people stay at the firms. Uh, but from the firm side, we're going to focus on short effects, right? Uh, the treatment firms hired these apprentices through the program. They're experiencing increases in profits um, in the intention to treat specification from getting access to these workers. So we think of that as evidence that there's some sort of labor market friction here, matching up apprentices to firms. Another thing that we find is that revenue and profit vary with worker cognitive ability, and that sort of informs the way that we think about what kind of friction this is. Um, basic program design, it's a national skill program. It was actually implemented by the government, but one thing that I think makes it a little bit different than some of the other programs that we've seen at this conference is that it's using this informal institution. So in the, the end, basically what the government did was match people. There's no sort of like heavy overlay bells and whistles of like a large job training program. They're taking firms that train apprentices anyway. They're taking people that live in the communities where these firms are and they're kind of linking them up. That's basically all that happened. Um, there's three main trade groups, construction, garment making, and cosmetology. So we're going to think those as, as, as 
most categories. There's gender segregation across these. So garment making is both men and women, although heavily women. Uh, cosmetology is almost exclusively women. It's like hair salons. Um, and construction is a bunch of different skilled construction trades um, that's almost exclusively men. I think we have like one female plumber. Um, so what happened? In the end, the government program essentially abolished the entrance fee. So what we're looking at is the traditional apprenticeship institution in the absence of this entrance fee. Um, and the firms, when they came and they asked to participate in the study, agreed when choosing to participate to hire any apprentice assigned through the program. We'll talk about in a second about how we actually matched people. Oh, okay, cool. I have plenty of time. Awesome. Um, so then you wonder why arms like will will in this program in the absence of the entrance fee? Um, we asked that because I like to just ask the people that we're trying to model. Uh, why are you interested in training NAP apprentices? So we have about a quarter who say that they think it'll be profitable, a quarter who say that um, they have a lot of customers, they need additional workers. Most people say they want to help vulnerable young people. So that may be the case. This may be motivated in part by altruism, but they're also sort of gaining something from it is what we see in the paper. Um, another sort of key piece of this context uh, which is echoed in this qualitative work that we did with firm owners, is what is the main reason apprentices are normally required to make a payment at the start of the apprenticeship? So 85% of firm owners tell us that the main reason is that they want to make sure that the apprentice is serious. And in this context, that means some combination of good, able to learn, motivated, et cetera. So we're going to use that. Um, to frame a tiny model, there's nothing, this is not groundbreaking theory, but maybe this gets us like a one or something. Um, but I'm only showing because I think it's really central to sort of thinking about how we interpret what we find. We're not going to test the model, we're just going to use it to sort of think about what we find. So imagine that, that uh, workers have two characteristics. They can be high ability or low ability <clears throat> with respect to their particular trade, and they also have some wealth endowment. So if firms are uninformed about the ability of potential workers and it costs them to bring someone into the business and train them up in the business, then they, they don't necessarily want to um, allow any worker into the firm because that cost to train someone up is meaningful. So one thing you can do to sort of generate a separating equilibrium is to offer a contract in which you pay apprentices in a way that's associated with the productivity of the firm or the productivity of the apprentice, um, and then require them to post this bond or pay this fee to enter into the apprenticeship, such that only high ability people, people who know that they're going to be good at this trade or they're going to be motivated or they're going to be serious, are going to be willing to pay the fee and sort of enter into this job and get paid uh, at a rate that's, that's correlated with the productivity of the firm or the productivity of the worker. So what that does is generates an equilibrium in which only these high ability people come. So I think that's a really sophisticated mechanism that kind of exists in the baseline labor market. But what that does is excludes high ability people who may have a wealth endowment that makes it impossible for them to, to pay this upfront fee, or maybe they're credit constrained. Like this is not a market in which you could typically get a loan to pay your apprenticeship fee. Um, so we're thinking of this government intervention as an alternative screening technology. So because there's all of this um, application procedures, and actually, as it turns out, the program was long delayed. So the people who make it to the end of this long delay and through all of these application procedures may have been using that to signal that they're high ability. And so what we're doing is we're sort of opening up the market to people who are potentially high ability but who couldn't afford to buy themselves into an apprenticeship, into this type of, of low paid work. Um, so some things need to be true for that actually to be like a reasonable um, interpretation. Just to sort of give you one more snapshot of some of this qualitative stuff. Uh, after how long do you typically know if an apprentice is good or not very good? Firm owners say, 95% of them say it takes me at least a month. Um, have you ever sent an apprentice away? It also has to be the case that you, there's some sort of inf informal firing constraint. So you can't, as soon as you find out that someone's not very great, like send them away. I think of this as like grad students and advisors. So, so you, have some, you have some incentive to do some pre-screening because you're kind of committed to this person over some sort of relatively long period. Um, do, you ever, do you give more chop money? Chop money is the sort of low paid wages. It's the colloquial term for the kind of wages that apprentices get. Do you give more chop money to better performing apprentices? Most people say they do. Okay. So what's the design? We have this kind of funky randomization. We had placement meetings across all of the 32 districts and each of the three trade groups. And in those meetings, 
Um, these 2,000 apprentices, according to their trade group in their district, were invited to come to the meeting. And firm owners in the area who were recruited by trade associations and by government um, because they wanted to get placed workers through this program came to these meetings. And then the firm owners introduced themselves. They said, my name is Jamie. I'm a development economist. I'm from UBC. That's who I am. I work in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then the workers provided lists of all of the people that they were willing to train with. So that was a function of geography. It was a function of interest. So if I say I'm a dressmaker and I focus on this type of dressmaking, maybe that's like of interest to the worker. It's also just sort of idiosyncratic. So we don't have a way of showing that this is a strategy proof mechanism. This was just a mechanism for ensuring that every worker who was supposed to get training through this program actually got a firm that was feasible for them sort of geographically and in terms of interest. Um, and then we randomized each worker independently from their list. So five minutes. All right, awesome. So I like to show this with a picture. These are our guys who wanted to get jobs as Masons. And there wasn't a restriction on the number of firms that they could list. So some people listed two, some people listed three. The average was two. Some people listed four. If you only listed one, you got that firm. Um, so the way we're controlling for this randomization is we're sort of uh, specifying the probability distribution of uh, outcomes, of treatment outcomes, along this sort of multi-valued treatment assignment for each of the firms, and we're just kind of grouping them together. So we're controlling for the entire probability distribution. Uh, this we don't need. It's balanced if you do that. Um, okay. So the main specification controls for the, the baseline value of the dependent variable. Uh, we're using... Where did I say this? We're using self-reported uh, we're using self-reported revenues and profits. So firm owners are just telling us the revenues and profits, and then we're using these two follow-up rounds. So I'm going to show it to you pooled, and I'm going to show it to you by round. Um, the first thing is just raw. This is not from um, this is not from a regression analysis. This is just looking at raw firm size. So you probably can't see it, but the the sort of mean value at the beginning is three, so the mean for firm is size three. And what I wanted to show here is that among the people who didn't get assigned any apprentices from this study, there's some turnover. So people leave the firm and people join the firm. It's not that there's like literally no hiring over that time period, but the average size of these firms is the same. So we're looking at sort of a classic example of small firms that are not growing over time. But the firms in our sample are growing by amounts that are similar to the take-up rates in the program. So among those people who came and went through this randomization, about half of them actually joined a firm and started working there. Um, and that's how much we're changing the size of the firm by. So to look at that in a regression framework, we can look at um, it's about 0.47 or about 0.5 by round two. Some people showed up late to their assignments. Okay. So the main outcomes here are profits. Um, these are reported in 2013 Ghana CDs, or we can look at the log, might be an easier way of doing it. Um, but in any case, this is somewhere around like 7%. So we're seeing that for every apprentice in an ITT framework that you got assigned to this program, you're seeing profit effects on a monthly basis that are meaningful and statistically significant. Uh, similarly for sales, although these are a little bit noisier, um, if we look at it uh, sort of as a distribution and we think about people who got assigned zero, people who got assigned one, people who got assigned two or three or more, we can sort of see that, that the distributions are shifting to the right. I don't know that there's like a ton of interesting stuff to say about where in the distribution we're sort of seeing these shifts, but in any case, another way of thinking about it. So back to our, our context of how to interpret this finding, if it's the case that these firms are hiring these people just because we said, why don't you hire them? Um, and also uh, that they're seeing profit gains from that, then there's something going on here. Like, why didn't this match happen in the absence of this program? Um, and we have a couple ways of kind of looking at that. So the first one is just to take the selection into the worker sample and look at selection into the work in worker sample. So if you, if you remember, we have how rich and poor you are and how high or low ability you are as measured by our cognitive indices and a like, classic asset index. And among the, the low people who come from low asset households, those who, who performed uh, above the median on this asset index are more likely to make it through this application process. So maybe that suggests that there's something to what we're saying about this interpretation. Another way of looking at this is we can restrict the, the sample to those firms who had interest from apprentices who were above the median or above whatever cutoff you want to think of in terms of cognitive ability as measured by this baseline measure for apprentices and below. And firms among those that, that had interest from both um, 
estimate the effects separately for those, uh, the assignment of above median cognitive ability apprentices and below median cognitive ability apprentices, and sort of think about if we can show that there are sort of differential returns to these kinds of workers. In this one, we have to control for the joint, joint distribution of the possibilities of all the different types of um, assignments. Um, this is a little bit hard to see, but this is separated out by two rounds, and what I want you to see is that the first and the third row are what we're calling high ability apprentices, and the second and the fourth row are what we're calling low ability apprentices. You can cut this different ways and it looks pretty similar. Um, but for example, <laughs> uh, for example, using this index, which is an index of the four types of uh, cognitive ability measures that we have, um, in the second round, uh, firms that got assigned high ability apprentices are seeing sort of statistically different increases in revenues and profits. So we have another one here. Um, okay, just to close up, I think what this tells you is that contrary to sort of a typical model where you think of the informal sector as being like completely frictionless, um, there appears to be some evidence of a labor market friction going on here. The other thing that I think is interesting from a jobs perspective is that the, there are returns to be had from employing an unemployed young person. And in fact, those, in turn, those returns vary with the cognitive ability of those people. So some of, um, some of the sort of high youth unemployment that we see could be explained by, could be explained by these labor market frictions. Um, I'm not sure that we can draw really strong policy implications from this program in particular, but I think sort of broadly we can learn that, that there's money to be made from employing um, unemployed young people in these kind of settings. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would like now uh, to allocate 10 minutes for questions, like if you may have any. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, maybe that's something important to look at, uh, both f for firms and also for, uh, for um, the youth who don't get placed into the program. So I think it would be, uh, the, the question is about spillovers. Okay, so I didn't show it here, but we've run spillover specifications for firms. Um, there's one district in which we have a census of all of the firms in the district. And so in that district, we can kind of characterize the firm selection also. And one sort of important starting point is that it's very few of the firms of the total in that district. So that's like maybe the first starting point. Um, but the second thing is if you run sort of spillover specifications that look um, at firms within various distances and how they're sort of influencing control firms in that area, we don't find anything. It's a good point about the youth. I haven't looked at that we have like recently the follow-up survey of the youth so I haven't I haven't sort of thought about how that affects the the youth who are not placed yeah thank you um, quick question you so the firm is uh, giving up on receiving this application fee, but at the same time they're making more profits. What's the cost-benefit analysis? Uh, have you done some cost-benefit analysis? So, because yes, I mean they're making more money, but Sorry, at the same can time, you say that again? the firms are doing what? They are uh, getting be higher profits, but okay. at the same time they're not receiving the application fee. So, right. what's the cost-benefit ratio of the oh, intervention? I see. So it will require that the higher profits persist at a certain amount over six months in order for that to compensate you for losing out on the fee. Um, the second follow-up is six months in, so I think that would suspect, that would sort of argue that over those six months you've kind of recovered the fee, and then you would have to think about how does that carry forward into time. Um, the, it may be the case that some of the workers who got placed through this program actually could have come up with the money for the fee, like asked a family member or something. It was intended to target low-income young people that couldn't pay the fee, but that screen was like extremely poorly implemented uh, by the government who recruited the workers. So it's possible that they may have actually faced that trade-off, like I could accept this fee or I could take this worker for free and then you know, receive the the sort of stream of returns that I get from having this worker and paying them a low wage. Um, but for some of the people who couldn't have come up with that fee, there's not really 
there's no, there's nothing on the other side. It's like either em employ the person and get this stream of benefits or not employ the person. Yes, I have a question about, you said that young apprentices don't have to pay the entrance fee, right? Mm -hmm. So that might affect this uh, not serious or not being serious. Do you find any dropout rate or any fighting rate, like a, a change in that? Um, so people definitely drop out, uh, mm -hmm. but we can also track the workers who were apprentices who were placed under a fee in those firms prior to this program and sort of over the course of the program because we're sort of asking apprentices about other apprentices at their firms. And the dropout rates are similar to people who are placed, um, who are placed via the sort of traditional pay mechanism. It's also the case that about 10% of people who work under the traditional mechanism don't pay, but those are typically family members. So if you're hiring someone who's anonymous to you, typically they pay. And, and the outcomes for apprentices across those who are placed through this program and those who, who pay to enter are similar also in terms of wages, they're similar in terms of dropout rates. So we think of them as kind of comparable screening mechanisms, although we can't say really, oh, this one is a tougher screen or an easier screen. So this is the obnoxious question about the market failure. So okay. I guess what I, what I want to know is, is, so we have these firms, they're charging these fees, and essentially you've replaced the fee with this sort of hassle, right? That they have to go through the process. So it's not that they're just marginally interested. And it seems to be very, very good for the firms. So what, do you have a sense of what has stopped or led firms to adhere to this current plan that isn't as profitable as, like, like, what's preventing them from overcoming this friction? Because it doesn't seem to be like specialized screening or, or something like that. Gotcha. It's that question. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it's that, it's that um, one. <laughs> uh, no, I don't know. I mean, we ask people. I, I would like to do a more systematic kind of qualitative ask of what's going on with these firm owners. Uh, Vittorio and I were talking about this yesterday. I think um, it could be possible that firm owners don't feel confident in their ability to screen someone. It's also the case that, that the way that this works traditionally, that you charge these people money, is only the way that people are placed in this kind of skilled trade sector uh, for novices who don't have experience with that kind of trade. There's a sort of secondary labor market. If you finish your apprenticeship after three years, and then you go and you try to get a job at maybe a slightly larger informal firm that's actually willing to hire paid workers at a larger piece rate, the first thing they do is they give you a test. Your skills at that point are, are demonstrable. You just show that you can sew something. And so in those cases, you don't have that same type of potential friction. So it could be that, that you know firm owners don't feel confident that there's like an alternative way to test for you know, motivation or, or ability to learn is kind of a harder thing to measure than some more demonstrable, like, physical skill set. Um, it could also be just kind of go with the flow. Like, this institution is pretty widespread, and, and so this is what everyone's doing. This is what people expect, and so that could also be part of the explanation. Uh, have you also asked these firm owners about the quality of the match that you are finding for them because you're also saving them some HR time and money, right? Yeah. So you mean some sort of like idiosyncratic match quality or just asking yeah. for a owners? about the kind of apprentices that you're finding for them? Like yeah, we haven't. That would be interesting, although I don't know that we have any additional data collection planned for them. Um, we sort of took the outcomes as evidence that it was working out, but yeah, I don't really know. It would be interesting to see. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, uh, great. OK, 
Okay. Okay, everyone. I am Vittorio Bassi from uh, USC, and this is joint work with uh, a number of co-authors. Most of, most of them are, are are back in London. We also suffer from the same criticism of the point on the title, although we do have a job search model that we take quite seriously, and we're going to do also some structural estimation here. Um, so, I mean, the motivation for this is, is, as we've heard in many other papers in this conference, is that youth un unemployment and underemployment have really become key challenges across the developing world. And this is particularly true in East Africa, where most of the population is young, and youth represent over 60% of the unemployed. And so, when you think about, again, the transition into the labor market for young people, there are kind of two key factors that might prevent young workers from entering the labor market. Now, on the one hand, Workers might lack kind of the skills, so it might be a human capital problem, they might lack the skills that need, they need in the labor market. But on the other hand, even though they might have those skills, there could still be substantial barriers to labor market entry. And so here I'm thinking about search costs, or I'm thinking about firms being unable to finance kind of the up, upfront screening and training costs needed to hire uh, a new worker. And so what we're going to do in this paper, we're going to show you uh, the results of a labor market field experiment that we designed to study, uh, to get at the importance of, of these two issues. And so we're going to focus on the Ugandan labor market. And there we implemented an RCT, a randomized control trial, that, had, that is two-sided in nature. So we are going to have both treatment and control workers and treatment and control firms. And so the RCT is going to allow us, of course, to measure, to measure, to recover in reduced form the impacts on both sides of the labor market, so on both worker outcomes and form outcomes, of three specific interventions that we designed specifically to try and help workers transition into the labor market. And so the first one is going to be the offer of vocational training, formal vocational training in class to workers before they enter the labor market. We're going to compare that to incentivizing firms to hire and train workers on the job through a wage subsidy. And finally, we compare this to a matching interventions where we just facilitate the meeting, the matching between workers and firms. Okay, so I'm going to tell you more about these interventions, but the rationale behind the vocational training intervention is to give, equip workers with productive skills, again, before they enter the labor market. But this is totally going to rely on the workers then being able to match to, f to firms on their own. There is not going to be any job search assistance in the, in the vocational training. Instead, the, the, se the, second, the second intervention, the on-the-job training intervention, is also, pro is also equipped to provide, is also targeted to providing workers with productive skills even though these might be different, as they're taught between the, in the firm rather than at the institutes, so and we're going to talk a lot about that, but also it's, going, it's designed to create an attachment between the worker and the firm, and so potentially to reduce search costs and these upfront screening and training costs needed to make a worker productive. And finally, with the final intervention, we're purely going to get at the importance of search costs. Since there is no training being provided to the worker, there is no wage subsidy provided to the firm. So I'm going to show the reduced form outcomes of this intervention, but then we try and go one step further to look at the mechanisms. And so we're also going to write down and estimate a structural job, job ladder model of worker search to uncover some of the reasons why these, these, uh, these, uh, these treatments are going to un uncover different effects in the long run. And here, we're going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to, we're going to uncover the importance of labor market mobility and kind of climb the job ladder as, as something that varies a lot between distributions, and, as, and, and so I'm going to talk about that and the reasons why we think this is going on. Now, as I said, this is a two-sided design, so I can look at outcomes both on the worker side and the firm side. In the interest of time today, I'm just going to focus on the worker side of the analysis, but uh, we have a companion paper where we're going to look at the, at the impacts of this on firm profits and, and so on. So we contribute to kind of a number of two main literatures, I think, in labor and development economics. And, you know, first of all, there is a long literature on training program evaluation. This has started, you know, started in the U.S., U.K., and, 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 and then more recently also extended to middle-income countries like Colombia or Jordan, for example. And so here, can our, our main contributions are really that we're able, because of our experimental design, to separate the returns to, in, to formal in-class vocational training on the one side and informal on-the-job training on the other, which is something that has been uh, debated at length in the literature. And also, this is one of the very few, or very first kind of extensions of this literature to a low-income country, right? So, so you think, you know, the returns to skills might be higher in low-income countries, and, and so it's interesting, both from an academic perspective, but also from a policy perspective, to try and understand how these kind of programs work in a developing country. And also there's a growing literature, as Jamie just, you know, uh, that's of course a, a very interesting example of that on, on, on trying to understand the constraints that small firms face in developing countries in growing. And so here our contribution uh, is going to be that we're really going to be able to separate the importance of search costs, so the, the difficulties meeting workers with the right skills, from kind of screening and training costs. Uh, and again, we can do this experimentally. In terms of innovations, 
we, I'm going to show you the, the, the impacts, that you, the outcomes that you, will, you would expect, which is going to be, of course, employment and earnings. But I'm also, we're also going to measure the skills of the workers. And this is important because it's going to allow us to talk about whether there is any meaningful human capital accumulation and what kinds of skills workers are learning through these different types of programs and how that's going to uh, explain the results. And we're also going to measure the tasks the workers perform on the job. So we're going to compare this across treatments. This is a relatively long-term study. We're going to follow workers for, workers for three years, which is not as usual in this literature. And again, I want to stress how combining kind of the reduced form part and the structural form part, we're going to really try and provide a rich picture of the mechanisms behind kind of the main impacts on employment and earnings. So we work in urban labor markets throughout Uganda. And we work with both firms and workers. So on the worker side, our sample includes young workers that had applied to uh, receive uh, scholarships to attend formal vocational institute, uh, formal vocational training in class, a and these are scholarships provided by BRAC NGO, our partner NGO, to be used at a number of training centers in learning how to be a hairdresser or a motor mechanic, and so on. And in order to be eligible, in order to participate, to be eligible to apply to these inter to these scholarships, workers had to come from a disadvantaged background in terms of economic terms. So they had to be poor. So there was a poverty assessments. And so uh, the eligible applicants that then are, are, um, are selected, they are about 20 years old on average. They are out of school. They have no previous vocational training. And most of them are either having no income or no, and not conducting any work. And the ones that are doing any work, they're doing mostly casual and very, very kind of unstable type, type of work. So it is kind of a very typical picture of unemployed youth uh, poor people in, in this context. So we're going to use the oversubscription design where we have over 1,700 of these workers that have applied to these scholarships to do the vocational training to offer them a, a number of treatments, as we'll discuss. Now, on the, on the firm side, we match these workers to a representative sample of small and medium enterprises that we identify in the same sectors, so again, address to motor mechanic, in the same urban areas through a census. And these are small, uh, are small firms. Okay, so to summarize the experimental design, we have our 1,714 workers that apply. Our first group is assigned the offer to receive this formal in-class vocational training. Our first group of, con of, of the ones assigned to vocational training, our first group is then left free to go in the labor market at the end of the six months training program. A second group instead at the end of the training program is then matched to a firm for a job interview. So here we're going to facilitate the meeting of a skilled worker that has gone through the six months training program to a firm. Uh, of the ones that are randomized out of vocational training, a first group is then matched to firms just for the job interview. So here we facilitate the meeting with the firms. A second group is facilitated the meeting with the firms and the firm is provided a wage subsidy to hire and train the worker for six months. And here we give a subsidy that is, that is about 60, 70 percent of the average unskilled wage as documented in our baseline uh, sample of firms. And we also give the manager a small incentive to train the worker uh, uh, on the job. An important difference I have to mention, of course, between the vocational training intervention and the firm training one is that the, form the, vo the, for the vocational training is very formal. It takes place in an institute, and there's going to be a certification that the worker has attended the institute. Instead, the workers that go through firm training, you should just interpret this as kind of a job experience, informal job experience. There is no certification. This is not part of a formal uh, program. So this is something important. And finally, we have a control group. We, as you can see from the design, we can draw a number of comparisons. In, there is, in the interest of time, and also for reasons that will become clear in the next slide, we are going to focus on two main comparisons of interest today. We're going to look at the pure effect of the vocational training, which is going to be T3 minus T1, and also the comparison between vocational training and firm training, okay, which is going to be T3 uh, minus T2. Okay, so just briefly on the timeline, I want to point out, uh, this is the timeline of our activities, just two things. We implement the matching intervention. So all those interventions that involve a firm are implemented right at the time where the vocational trainees have finished the vocational training. We did that so that everybody, everybody, everybody was kind of entering the labor market at the same time. And so we're going to have three follow-up surveys. So we're going to look at data from the 12 months, 24 and 30 six months uh, uh, from, from, the, uh, from the interventions. Now, in terms of take-up, we have relatively high take-up of the offer of starting the vocational training, 60-70%, and actually conditional take-up, nobody, pretty much nobody drops out. And so this is consistent, again, with these workers really wanting to do this vocational training. Now, on the, w the, where things get a little bit more tricky is on when is, is on take-up for those interventions that require the firm to be interested in the intervention to, to actually have take-up. So we have about 25% uh, of the workers that are, are assigned to the on-the-job training intervention that are actually taken on by a firm. And uh, you see that the, um, the kind of take-up rates gets really low as the firm is not provided a wage subsidy. 
So I think from here we can already draw some conclusions about the labor market in this context. So first of all, the very low, the very low take up rates without the wage subsidy and uh, tell, tell us the kind of, you know, uh, search cost, the, 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 the very simple type of search cost that could be solved by simply increasing the meeting rates between workers and firms doesn't seem to be a constraint in this context. Okay. Now, what we're going to do for the rest of the analysis, we're going to we're going to pull T3 and T4 for power, since extremely few of the workers are actually hired here, and we're actually going to drop T5 from the analysis because there is evidence from the job search literature that even these very kind of light touch interventions, where you may be provided opportunity to meet a firm, may change the expectations and, the and potentially the search behavior of workers, and so we're actually looking at, at this group of workers uh, separately in a different study. So the estimation is going to be very, the reduced form estimation is going to be very plain vanilla here. We're just going to, I'm just going to show you an ITT estimate of the impacts of, uh, of these um, uh, of these treatments by pooling, uh, to start from, I'm going to start with, I'm going to pull the three, uh, the three post-intervention waves. And so we have, uh, we, have we, have, we have some attrition, but this is not uh, correlated with treatment and we can, we can provide robustness checks. So we're going to interpret our betas and as intention to treat uh, parameters. Okay, the first thing I want to show you is this kind of new evidence that we can provide on the skills of the workers. So the first thing we know is that everybody, all the workers that follow up, we're asking whether they received on-the-job training at their first employer. So this is asked to everybody even uh, in the post-intervention period, even to workers in control and vocational training. Now you see two interesting things coming out of this. So first of all, as you might expect, the workers that were matched to a firm and the firm was provided a subsidy to train the worker, indeed report having been trained much more than control. Okay? So it's consistent with some on-the-job training actually taking place at the firms that were supposed to train them. What is interesting is that the workers that w did the vocational training don't receive any further training once they enter the labor market. If anything, the point estimates are negative relative to the control group. So this is the first piece of evidence that we're putting together to claim that the workers that went to the firm training and the workers that went through vocational training are actually learning different types of skills as the firm trainees are trained at the firm and the vocational trainees are trained in the institutes but they, they don't receive any, any additional training. Now, we also went ahead and measured the skills of the workers through a te skill test. And the test was designed to be sector specific rather than firm specific. So for example, in model, for workers that either had the model mechanic tra uh, training or wanted to do model mechanics, we're asking a bunch of questions about different kinds of scenario into the, the model mechanics kind of profession. And so you see that even though the firm trainees report m they report to be trained much more than control, we find that they actually don't score any higher on the sector specific test. Instead, the, even though you know, the, it, there is a lot of margin for improvement right, over the control, instead the vocational trainees score about a third of a standard deviation higher on this test. And so again, when we ask workers about how, uh, whether they feel their skills are transferable or not, we find that again, the vocational trainees report their skills to be much more transferable, potentially more general, than the firm trainees that if anything, again, this is noisy, but they, point, they, they, they have skills that are they, they think are less transferable. Now, the interesting thing from this table is that if you compare the effect of firm training and vocational training, these are five minutes. These are all significant at the five at the five percent level. So this is again telling us that the workers in vocational training and firm training are learning different types of skills. With the firm trainees learning more firm specific, it is indirect evidence that the firm trainees are learning more firm specific skills, while the vocation that are less transferable, and the vocational trainees are learning more. Uh, sector general skills are more transferable, potentially also because of this certification that we are not going to be able here to disentangle. So I as a result of this, we see the workers in, in the two types of treatments end up doing different types of tasks at the firms they match to. So here, here we ran kind of a non a task kind of questionnaire. So we asked the workers at, at what kind of task among a possible list of tasks they were doing. And we see that when you look at the difference between the percent, so these are all the tasks the workers could do in the different, tre in the different sectors. When you look at the percentage of workers in vocational training that are doing a given task, minus the percentage in firm training that are doing a given task, there's a lot of variation. So there are some tasks that are dominated by vocational trainees, some tasks that are dominated by firm trainees. We don't know which one of these are firm specific or not, but it's, this is again consistent with the two types of workers doing different types of skills. So how do these things then map into employment and earnings? Well, this, I'm just going to pull the three years here in, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this table. We're looking at the two key outcomes of uh, extensive margin of employment probability. We find a large effect of both programs, mostly uh, and, and particularly high of the vocational training, this is about a 20% increase in employment probability. Now, the, the remarkable thing, I think, is that we find a 34% increase in labor market earnings over the three-year periods for the vocational trainees while we, and, and, and a somewhat slower effect from the uh, firm trainees. Now, I don't have time to go into the structural uh, model here, but just let me give you one, one, a couple of sentences of why, you know, how we use this, uh, this. First of all, we can estimate, to provide even more evidence on the mechanisms behind these effects, and start to talking about the dynamics, 
we can uh, we measured we collected spell level data on the labor market outcomes of all the workers that went to the program. So for each month, for three years after the intervention, we know whether the worker was employed at a which wage, unemployed, and we document job to job transitions, job to unemployment, and unemployment to job transitions. So we can use this to estimate a standard off the shelf job ladder model. And so uh, we are going to do this on the last two waves of data because, of, of course, this is a steady state model. It requires the workers to be in steady state, right? So we're going we're gonna to throw out the first round of data. After one year, we're going to focus on two and three years after the intervention where we think kind of transition rates might be closer to the steady state for these workers. And now, the very nice thing that we find here is that there is much higher labor market mobility for the vocational trainees. So they have both higher probability of exiting unemployment, and so the transition from unemployment to unemployment is higher, but it's not just that. It's not just a level effect. These workers are also climbing the job ladder faster. They have higher job-to-job -job transitions. Instead, the, what is really remarkable about the firm trainees is that they, once they, they get initially because they get employed at the firm that they, they train them, but once they fall off the job ladder, they start to look more and more like control. So over time, their transition probability is go back slightly to control, okay? So this is, again, consistent with the vocational trainees and we learn more transferable and, 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 and general skills and the firm trainees have been learned skills that are very useful at the initial firm but then, and very, because they're firm specific and so once they kind of lose their initial job, they kind of start losing out. So of course you can use the model to back out and imply the kind of steady state and employment rate and earnings and so we can feed this into, which now takes into account the decreasing kind of effect of the firm training intervention over time, okay? Yeah, so it is last two slides. So if you, I'm going to spare you all the calculations, but the key numbers you should take away from this IRR calculation is that we have about a 20% internal rate of return for the vocational training intervention. And instead, for the firm train, fr training intervention, this number is about 10%, but it's also very sensitive to the duration of the benefits because these firm trainees are on a downward trend. Instead, there is and this is remarkable to me, there is absolutely no evidence of decay of the vocational training intervention after three years. So these workers are on a different path completely. So just to conclude, I think we've documented high returns to training, especially vocational training. And so the key question is, again, why don't these workers self-invest in this training? These training centers are there, the workers can go. Well, these workers, we point to credit constraints as, a, as an important mechanism here. Now, these are, this is not the average unemployed youth. These are poor average, these are poor unemployed youth. They showed, an they showed us a, a, a large willingness to do this. They went through a lengthy application process. And so we think credit constraints could actually bind for this kind of population. Now, why are large, why do we, we document large effects. I mean, we have a 34% increase in earnings co relative to the literature on, on training programs in anywhere in the world, this is, this is among the, the highest uh, returns uh, ever documented. So why is this? Well, again, I said this is one of the very f first studies that extends this to low income settings where the returns to these kinds of skills might be just higher. And also, again, I pointed to the selection of workers into the experiment. These are motivated, poor, but highly motivated workers. So we're bringing into employment workers that are, you know, they want to get trained. And finally, it's important, especially for policy, to, to discuss for a second the kind of the treatment intensity of VTI and vocational training quality. This was a highly intense program. The vocational training was six months, every day, six hours of training, with room and board provided at some of the highest quality vocational training institutes in Uganda. So it's not clear at all that you could have replicated these results by giving workers vouchers and asking them to go and spend it at their preferred vocational institute. This relies on workers having complete information on which are the high quality institutes. We cannot speak to what would be the returns along the VTI quality distribution, that would be an interesting kind of extension potentially. And so just one, one, one thing to conclude again, why, why are the differences, why, what, are, what is driving the difference between vocational training and firm training? We point to these kind of dif difference in types of skills that are learned. The vocational trainees learn more general and transferable skills and so they're ha they are able to climb the job ladder. The firm trainees learn more sector specific, uh, firm specific skills and so they, they have more trouble than, than climbing the job ladder over time. My question goes a bit to the general, how general these results are. So this is high quality vocational training versus firm training. Can you tell us how this firm training is and what is actually the, the dollar amount of the vocational training versus the dollar amount of the firm training? Are they getting the same amount of money at the firm level? 
Uh, and why one cannot think of a situation where the firm can train them, but they can send them to train to this top training institution, but to think that they are highly relevant to the firm? Yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's an excellent point. Now, there are many differences between the on-the-job training treatment and the vocational training treatment. So uh, one of them is that the, the, vocational training uh, tr the vocational training centers are very high quality. These are instead, if important for interpretation, these are average firms. Right? We get a random sample of firms, and so this is not telling us about what would be the returns of the best firms in Uganda. So that, that, could, that could be an important explanation. Now, in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, cost, we have about, you know, the, the vocational training cost about 500, about 400, the direct cost, direct cost is 470 compared to 300. So these are kind of order of magnitudes higher than what these workers, the average earnings of these workers at baseline per month are $5. Okay, so there's no way these workers could afford this. Now, could the firm pay for this? Yes, now why aren't they sending them to the vocational institutes? I mean, again, one, explana you know, one explanation is that if you go to the vocational institute, you are going to learn very general skills and you're going to get a certificate. Now, if, you know, we know from models of investment general training that then the worker gets the benefit of that. And so it's not even clear the firm would want that, right? The firm might have an interest in training workers in firm-specific skills that they cannot signal to other firms. So uh, there is, might be, just might, yeah, firms might not be willing to pay for this kind of general training. Um, so, yeah, let's see. so yeah, my, my question was very similar to that one. So it's, I think that that last slide of conclusions is a bit of reclaiming the, the, the relative benefits of the vocational training in the sense that you said that these are the best uh, institutes for the vocational training versus like medium firms that are very slow on average. And, uh, and are not like six hours per day during six months investing in training their employees. So it's just a different kind of, it's not a similar treatment in different scenarios, vocational versus uh, firm specific, but it's just uh, the dose of the treatment is just completely different. So Yeah, so the reason why we try to make a comparison between the two is because these are usually kind of uh, thought as policy alternatives to try and, and train and skill the population of workers. And, uh, and so of course, yeah, so there, uh, there are some limitations to the comparisons that we can draw, but I think we can learn. I think the, 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 the striking result of the vocational training is that it's a proof of concept that the returns to skills are high in this context for this kind of population, and, uh, and which is not what we were thinking looking at, at training evaluations in other contexts. On the firm training, there is much more to do. I think it's, you know, uh, but, but the, the, again, it's, it's, yeah, it relies on, you know, you could improve on this. Perhaps, maybe, we don't know, from having workers trained at the top firms. But again, how do we identify the top firms and so on? This is, this is, this is more, diff yeah, it's, it's something to, to think about. Yeah. Thank you very much for the nice presentation. So uh, I'm not sure, are these ITTs that you're calculating intent to treat or something else? That's my first question. And uh, it's a fascinating result because most of the studies on vocational training found almost no effects or at least mixed results. So this is fascinating. And uh, so w do you think that you know there was something specific to Ghana that would derive the result that we can't find it, like for example in Jordan, in Nigeria, in so many other countries that yeah. these experiments have been done? Yes, very good. So uh, first of all on the ITT, yes, these are all ITT estimates. Now, you could say, why don't you do IV, why don't you do late? Uh, you know, the take-up rates are very different. We thought a lot about that. Now, the reason is the following, is that the selection process into these treatments is extremely different. The, for two reasons. These are all workers that, first of all, apply to vocational training. They didn't apply for the firm training. So the, f the workers that do choose to take up the firm training might be very different from the ones that do choose to take up the vocational training. Second, the firm training is a two-sided selection problem. It's the f for the match to actually re realize, you need the firm to be interested, the worker to be interested. For the vocational training, the, vocation the vocational training doesn't say no. So that's very important because if you do late, it's not clear what are, who are the compliers. And, and actually, it might even be, the comparison might even be more difficult. So from a policy perspective, you know, here we're taking the kind of policy approach and say, you know, the government has a dollar to spend here and there. And so we're just saying these are the ITT estimates. Now, on the external validity, I think, I, I mean, I, I don't, normally I don't like the explanation of credit constraints. I think it's some, sometimes it's a little bit of a cheap way out. But in in this case, these are poor workers that are earning $5 a month, $5 a month, how can they pay for $460 of training? So in Jordan and Colombia and other, you know, training evaluations in other countries, 
it's i want to claim that it's easier to find the sort of money to enroll and so you know if you think credit constraints are not binding then the workers that are not enrolling are the ones that have low returns and so you're going to find low returns to training here we really think there is a population of high potential return workers that are excluded because of credit constraints and i, I tend to believe this explanation here more than in other higher income countries yes Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so we don't we are not able to disentangle that experimentally. Now we can use the evidence from the skills to to the skills table is meant to show some suggestive evidence the workers are learning different types of skills and so there is some role for the firm specific training going on in explaining the results it could be certification i mean that's why in my other paper I presented yesterday we isolate the role of the certification we find that has an effect so clearly you know some of this could be explained by but again it's clear why the firm doesn't want necessarily to provide any certification because that's basically providing general human capital and the firm doesn't want to invest for that Yes, absolutely. Uh, now, how that would it change the invest the firms to train? That's that's the interesting point, though, right? They might change the firm, the incentives of the firms to train, but it would be an interesting. Right now, these are not provided uh, in this context, but. Uh. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the study I am presenting uh, is part of a large collaboration of the World Bank with uh, the NGO Harambi. Harambi is a South African NGO that is working in the space of youth employment. Um, they provide assessment and placement services for more than 200 large corporations in the country. Um, Um, South Africa has a severe youth unemployment program, problem. The level and quality of education is low and is weakly correlated with actual skills. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as in many other countries, the youth have uh, weak connections to the labor market. And as a result of this, uh, the youth are not able to learn about their own skills, they cannot rely on job networks, and they cannot signal their skills to employers using uh, education attainment or grades as a signal. Um, on the other side, the firms have very limited ability to observe skills and cannot afford costly screening mechanisms. Uh, so since the risk of uh, making costly mistakes during hiring is high, um, these firms will tend then to grow uh, at a slower pace. Um, with these concerns in mind, um, we uh, partner with Harambi to introduce certification reports as part of the regular work, and we designed a study to understand how information frictions affect job search and employment decisions. Our experiment will manipulate job seekers and firms' beliefs uh, by giving work seekers more information on their skills and by allowing them to signal their skills to firms. Um, we will focus on a population of low skill disadvantaged youth for whom skill signals are expected to be particularly noisy. And on the supply side, um, this intervention will help address information frictions that we believe um, change employment and earning outcomes by changing uh, job search behavior. On the demand side, our intervention um, is expected instead to affect these outcomes by changing uh, the decisions that the firms make at their hiring time, uh, even if there is no change on the side of the job seekers. 
Uh, we don't make any assumptions on which type of workers in terms of skills are going to be most affected by these information frictions, but instead we will allow uh, the pattern of heterogeneity of results uh, to tell us ab about this. Um, so we assess skills in six domains, uh, three cognitive and three non-cognitive domains, and two important criteria uh, used when choosing uh, the assessments that we were going to include was um, the correlation of the indicators that we were going to obtain with measures of productivity and employability and whether uh, work seekers were going to be able to convey new information to firms uh, based on this thing. <coughs> to set on the, on the number of assessments and the type of assessments that we were going to conduct, uh, we really drew on the expertise of Harambi uh, in this type of assessment and placement work uh, to do this analysis so that we were selecting really the most promising type of uh, assessments and indicators. Um, we randomly assigned job seekers to three treatment arms. Um, we don't randomize at the individual level, but what we will do is to do uh, an assessment level, an assessment day level randomization using sequential blocking. Uh, by, uh, what I mean by this is that we will um, divide the trial period time uh, into blocks of nine days, mm -hmm. and then among those nine days, we are going to randomize three days to control, three days to uh, the public treatment, and three days to the private treatment. Uh, and we do this like to uh, control uh, for potential, you know, um, contamination effects between uh, individuals that are attending uh, the assessments on the same date who receive uh, different uh, treatment uh, from, from our intervention. Um, the job seekers in the private and public treatment good uh, will receive uh, reports containing the same type of information regarding their skills, but the reports will differ um, in whether they can be used to signal skills credible in a credible way to potential employers. So let me show you two examples uh, of the reports that we are giving to the youth in the private and public treatment arms. The private reports do not have a format that can be credibly provided to employers. Um, as you can see, there is uh, no identifying information or any sort of branding. And instead, in the public group, uh, I'm sorry, in the private, uh, in the public group, that is on the right side, I'm starting to mix up things. Um, in the public group, uh, we are including um, the name and ID of the work seeker. We are branding the reports with the logos of Harambi and the World Bank. Um, and, and we are uh, providing also, you know, the firms like with a link that where they can log in to check uh, whether the results of the job seeker were actually there and whether this guy was a part of, a, of the activity uh, in, which, in which we are uh, intervening. Um, all the reports are going to contain uh, an explanation of what the assessment consisted on and uh, some guidelines on how they should interpret this information. Um, and all reports will also place uh, work seekers in terciles rather than uh, providing absolute scores in these tests. Um, in order to make this choice, we piloted several versions of the report, and we saw that uh, absolute scores were not really informative. People didn't know what to do with the absolute scores. Uh, and a mix of both types of information started to become too much information uh, and, and too confusing. So in addition to these reports, uh, both treatment groups uh, received feedback in a group briefing with a psychologist from Hanambi. Uh, the briefing took like about one hour long. Um, they, again, like were receiving information on how to interpret uh, the results that they were obtaining and how they could, you know, like try to use this information uh, in their job search, right? Um, a small number of participants also received a placebo report that is going to look very similar uh, to the reports that we gave to the public group, but we are not including any information on the assessment's results. 
So just to see whether this is actually um, the information that we are co transmitting in terms of the assessment results, or whether this is just the effect of having the World Bank logo, having Harambe logo on the report. Um, so we collected uh, a very rich uh, database, <coughs> data set um, of multiple um, job search and employment outcomes, um, time and risk preferences, uh, and particularly very rich in terms of information regarding uh, beliefs about own skills and beliefs about the potential returns that they could obtain to job search. Um, the work seekers completed a computerized baseline survey before the assessment, and then um, two to three days after the intervention, after they received feedback through the physical reports and the briefing with the psychologist, uh, we contacted them with a text message survey, and we asked them about their perceived skills, and we also asked them about their self-esteem. Um, we wanted to identify any immediate uh, belief updating or any other effects that the intervention was having on the morale of the job seekers if the uh, information update was negative. Um, we, I, I will tell you briefly uh, later as well, but um, we see that there is an updating in their beliefs about their skills. Uh, we didn't see any negative effects on, on morale. And then uh, two to three, uh, three to four months from treatment, we are going to do a phone survey. And one interesting feature of this survey is that we are going to randomize the date when we are going to survey the job seeker. So um, we are randomizing whether the work seeker is going to be interviewed in a date between the, the three and the four months after the intervention, and this will allow us to have a continuous measure uh, of job search and employment outcomes. Um, we will do the same with the second, or we have done the same with the second follow-up, uh, which has been recently completed, but we are not uh, yet analyzing. Um, so we obtained treatment effects after three to four months by estimating the equation I present in the screen. Um, y, as usual, is the outcome indicator. The private and public uh, variables there are the treatment assignments. S will be the randomization block fix effects. Uh, we include covariates, uh, and standard errors will be clustered at the treatment day level. Uh, we would test for treatment effects on two type of or two sets of different outcomes. One of them will be aggregate indices of outcomes, where we are grouping outcomes uh, in families, and we are doing this in order to address any concerns regarding multiple testing um, you know, of outcomes. And we are also going to look at individual level outcomes regarding beliefs, job search, behavior, and employment status and quality uh, to get some more in-depth insights about what is uh, driving our results. So in this table, I am reporting effects on uh, seven outcome family indices uh, expressed in, in standard deviations. Um, both treatments, uh, what we observe is that both treatments are increasing the accuracy of job seekers' beliefs about their own skills and that effects are large. Um, Something that I don't report here is that they also are going to update their beliefs about their perceived returns um, to job search, uh, but the effects are going to be mo smaller than the ones that we observe on the perceptions that they have of their own skills. Um, you can also observe here that the public group increases the employment status index by 0.13 standard deviations. The private effect is much smaller, less than half the magnitude that we observe for the public group. And um, the private group also has like insignificant effects. Um, the coefficients uh, of the public and private groups on the, uh, are uh, statistically um, different. Also, uh, know that while both groups are going to uh, be updating their beliefs, only the group that can signal their skills 
is going to see an improvement in their employment outcomes. And we are interpreting this as suggesting that there are supply side frictions, but the information frictions on the demand side are actually the ones that are distorting uh, the employment outcomes and the earning outcomes that we are observing later. Um, also interesting in this table is that uh, none of the groups um, is exhibiting any effects on uh, search effort or effectiveness. Uh, and in order to tell a little bit more of what is happening here, we are going to exploit the random variation in the date of the follow-up survey. Um, and we will find that the public group did increase search effort, but that the effects were decreasing over time as the work seekers uh, were finding a job. So what we can see here is um, the public treatment is increasing the likelihood of being currently working, having worked at any point of time since baseline, and it's also going to increase the number of hours worked uh, in the preceding week. Uh, the effects of the private treatment group instead are uh, smaller and insignificant. Um, we, were, we are going to, um, no, let me, let me get back sick. So we are going to look also further into employment quality. And what we are going to find uh, is that um, earnings are higher in both treatment groups compared to the control but wages are only significantly higher for the, um, yeah, for the public group. Um, the estimates are noisy, so we cannot really detect there any statistical significant differences between the two treatment groups. And we do not find any effects on the likelihood that the work seeker will have a permanent or a written contract. Uh, but the public group is going to be more likely to be in wage employment as opposed to self-employment. Um, <coughs> so conceptually, we were expecting uh, the effects to differ by a skill level. As I was telling you, a, a, priority, a priori, we didn't want to impose um, any structure on what that, that relationship should be, but we wanted to let the data uh, tell us about this thing. Um, the figure is going to show the fitted values from local linear regressions of employment outcomes on a skills, on a skills assessment index uh, by treatment group. And what we can observe is that these results are showing a strong relationship between uh, skills and employment status. Uh, in the public group, the measure of employment status uh, is weakly increasing in uh, skills throughout the distribution of uh, skills, uh, except maybe a little bit on the tails. Um, and in addition, we observe that the measures are higher for the public group uh, than for the private or the control groups. Um, uh, however, there is little evidence of heterogeneous treatment effects uh, in the sense that the gap between the public and the uh, other two groups is similar at all levels of the skill distribution. Um, there are two reasons why we believe um, is the effects may differ by skills. Uh, a first explanation is that work seekers with different skills receive and are able to signal different information to firms or that they will use information as signals in a different way. So our design allows us to try to identify uh, what is uh, going on. Um, we, we're, we are going to explore these issues uh, in more depth in the future, but we have uh, started to explore them using results from the numeracy assessment, which is a variable that gives us uh, a continuous uh, measure, and we are exploiting the discontinuities that we have around the third size in which these work seekers uh, are placed. So to test uh, for the first uh, type of explanation, what we are going to do 
is uh, we are going to look at work seekers with similar skills that receive different information on those skills. They were placed in different air styles. Um, and only the public group will be able to signal uh, the third side in which they were assigned. Um, and so we do this by comparing work seekers at the margin of those third cells. And to test for the explanation number two, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to look at work seekers that have different skills, but that are assigned to the same third side. Um, the overall results uh, of the public treatment effect heterogeneity by skills are more consistent with heterogeneous treatment than uh, with treatment effect heterogeneity. So that means uh, that our findings are indicating that work seekers with different skills are signaling uh, different information to firms, right? Um, in the public group, people who scored just above the threshold um, to be in a higher tercile are marginally more likely to be employed and more likely to have um, higher earnings. And besides, we find that there are no effects for the private group, suggesting that effects are driven by employers' uh, more favorable response to people who uh, has uh, more positive signals rather than uh, operating through changes in work seekers' beliefs. So, and finally, just to summarize briefly, uh, our results are consistent with information frictions in the labor market and are emphasizing that while well, frictions on the supply side affects beliefs and job search behavior, it's the frictions on the demand side, the ones that are behind the employment outcomes that we are observing. And again, like as I mentioned, uh, this uh, analysis is only preliminary, so we will look at both lo long-term effects, and we will also go deeper trying to understand what is uh, driving that heterogeneity by skill level. Thank you. Can I take uh, some questions, Leo? Besides that in the, in the belief, there is a different effect on the change in the belief between uh, the private and the public. Now, given the content is exactly the same, the why they would update differently their belief? And it looks like it's statistically uh, insignificantly different. So that's my question. Uh, y yes, there are like at least uh, two explanations that we have for that. Uh, one can be just the report itself. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, or as I was showing, the public reports includes the work seekers' name several times. So it's reinforcing this message of like, you are uh, performing this well relative to other people. Uh, so that may be driving the results. Uh, we cannot test for that. But what we are uh, being able to explore a little bit more is whether it is actually that work seekers are, um, their beliefs or their, update, their updating or beliefs is being reinforced by the reaction that they observe in the, from the firms when they increase uh, their search, right? Um, so that they start searching more and they start receiving like a more positive reactions from the applications they submit, which uh, makes them uh, strengthen or, you know, the, the belief updating. Uh, and we are trying to look into that by, um, you know, exploiting both the different, the information that we collected immediately after the intervention and uh, the information that we have like three months later. What we are seeing is that the updating uh, stays. So during those three months, the work seekers have updated their beliefs, uh, but it seems to be uh, increasing over time for the work seekers that were in the, in the public treatment arm. Any any other questions? Okay, um, then we are ready to wrap up. Uh, I would like to thank you for participating in this session. 
Uh, we appreciate very much your contributions to the discussion, uh, and I will invite you outside to enjoy of the coffee break or, or lunch that we have prepared for you. Thank you. Solución. Sí, no es mal, sí, yeah. señor. Sí,